By now I'm sure you've got me pegged. You think that he's an English teacher. He just loves picking on people who mess up the tiniest details. And I do. <laughs> That's why we're going to talk about grammar. Nah, seriously, there's a reason why I waited until this late in the semester before we really get into the whole grammar question. I remember when I was going to school, high school, middle school, elementary school, all that jazz, people loved shoving grammar down my throat. And I remember choking on it, like most people do. But I never had much of a problem with it because I read a lot. I've always read a lot. And... Experts will tell you that's the best way to get good at your grammar is to read a lot, write a lot, and think critically about both. Having said that, though, I see enough key errors to where there are things you should know to check. And that's why we're here. When Does Grammar Matter talks about the differences between a descriptive and prescriptive approach... I have a lot of sympathies towards the descriptive approach because it is important to note that there isn't just one correct way to do everything, and it depends on where you are. However, we do have a definite place. We are in the academic community. We're all scholars, and one of the things that scholars end up doing is they end up discussing things. When you end up discussing things, you need to be able to speak the same language. Otherwise, you just can't talk to each other and everything breaks down. So what are the big areas in academic grammar that we need to really think about? I'm not going to do a complete and utter overview of grammar at this point. You've had 12 years of high school, and anyway, the experts say the best way to really learn your grammar is to do a lot of reading and a lot of writing and to think critically about both. But there are issues that we need to touch on. So, the first biggest error is going to be structure errors. Sentence structure errors for the most part. Whether we're talking about comma splices, run-on sentences, or fragments. Those are the big things that can really stop us from understanding what the sentence is trying to say. To take it back just a step... What is a sentence supposed to do anyway? Well, at the lowest level, a sentence is some kind of subject, person, or a thing performing some kind of action. That's it. Sentences can get more complex than that. But when they do, you have to be that much more careful with the structure. Because if you don't have a clear sentence structure, we're really going to have a hard time knowing just what in the heck you're talking about. The second big area where grammar goes bad has to do with agreement. We're talking about things like subject-verb agreement. The man rode his horse. The crowd ran their horses. You have to have singular, singular, plural, plural. Noun and pronoun. You don't say he did her best. Noun and pronouns usually have a fairly rigid structure. Individual versus plural. You, If you're talking singular, you stay singular. If you're talking plural, you stay plural. Verb tense has to have a certain level of agreement. You don't mysteriously go from past tense to present tense within the scope of a paper. It is generally accepted that academic writing stays in past tense, with the exception of when you're using the present text to describe what a book does. Then there's narrative voice. Narrative voice needs to agree all the way through. You don't go into I or you unless there's good reason to do so. You don't jump back and forth between I, we, us, them, so on and so forth. Consistency in narrative voice. Make sure everything agrees with its purpose. And when those things don't happen, it's very hard for us to discern the meaning when the words don't even agree with each other. Then we have modifiers. 
and you have heard of either misplaced modifiers or dangling modifiers. What's the difference between them? Well, really, who cares? But if you're a grammar nerd, it might be more interesting to know the difference between them, but let's just tell you what kind of errors you're going to see here. Eating like a pig, my cake was gone in seconds. This is a modifier error, because eating is supposed to be a modifying the people who are eating it, not the cake. And literally, this does say that the cake was eating it. Kind of silly, huh? My kind of humor. When you get these things wrong, it just makes you look like an idiot. There's parallelism. And that involves making sure you're using the same types of verbs. Sasquatch enjoys taking long walks in the forest, playing with small woodland animals, and to devour wandering tourists. Non-parallel construction. And when you do errors in this way, the problem is it just makes you look like you're not really paying all that much attention and making stupid errors. The one, though, that drives me very crazy it just kind of gets my blood boiling and makes it weird. It has to do with sentences and how sentences are constructed. We talked about a subject performing some action. If we want to get uh, official grammar terms, it's a subject and the predicate need to exist both in the same sentence. The subject is everything relating to the subject, and the predicate is everything relating to the action. Together, a normal sentence, the hero rescued the crowd. The hero, the subject. What did the hero do? Rescued the crowd. The crowd is modifying rescue. The problem comes when the subjectivity isn't clear. And this happens in things like this. The crowd was rescued by the heroes. Usually, it would just be the crowd was rescued, which is worse because then I have no idea who's doing the rescuing. But the actual subject is pushed way the heck in the back instead of being out front. Now, there are artistic reasons to do this in some points in time. You might want to stress the action as opposed to the person performing the action. If you're doing business writing, for instance, or writing a set of instructions, sometimes in a set of instructions you do want to focus on the action and ignore the subjectivity. But in standard academic writing, probably not a good thing. When this happens, this is called the passive voice. I will talk about passive verb tenses, and they're passive because the subjectivity isn't clear. Who's performing the action? Well, that's kind of thrown in the back. It's passive. Luckily, there's a secret for learning when a verb is active or passive, and it involves zombies. You gotta love any grammar rule that involves zombies, right? If you can insert the phrase by zombies after the verb and have the sentence make sense, you have a passive voice. She was killed by zombies. Passive. Zombies killed her. Well, putting zom by zombies after it, zombies killed by zombies her makes no sense whatsoever. It's already active. We already know who's doing the subject. The secret? Zombies. Now, this is important, particularly in a lot of writing where the, you need to know the subject. And if the subject is hidden, it can really weaken your argument at time. Luckily, zombies are there to save us. Bet you never thought you'd hear that one, huh? So do I ever screw up grammar? <laughs> Me and my wife have a nice long time running debate on whether you talk about uh, when I'm in the car. I could have went right then, or I could have gone right then. Which one is right? It can really bring the blood boiling. We start breaking out cricket bats and hitting each other over the head. Anyway, I'm not saying at any point that if you don't do these things you're not a good person because i'm not trying to teach you how to change the way you talk or write or think what i am trying to teach you is how you adapt to this new environment we're in and academics is a new environment which requires a lot of formality business is a new environment which requires a lot of formality uh technical oriented stuff requires a lot of formality so think about this as learning the rules to your new life that doesn't sound too pretentious huh see you in the next video